Well, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. I hope this finds you and your loved ones doing well. We want to thank you for attending this virtual programming series. These events are brought to you by the faculty and staff that are typically held during family weekend. As you know, Renault College was unable to host Family Weekend this year, so we wanted to ensure that families still have an opportunity to obtain more information about some opportunities your students have during their studies here at the college. Please know that you can visit the college web page at renault.edu forward slash parents to find more helpful resources. My name is Sally Logan Walker, and I have the pleasure of serving the college as the Director of Alumni and Donor Relations. And our office also engages with families with the Office of Family Relations. I want to thank our colleagues who have collaborated with us to bring these topics to you virtually. Before we begin our discussion, I wanna cover a few logistics logistical points, um, please use the chat feature to present questions today. We will attempt to cover as many of the questions as possible. And today's session is being recorded and will be available on the Office of Alumni and Family Relations YouTube channel beginning this Friday. Today's virtual event is entitled From Dream to Plan, brought to you by the Office of Career Services. And here to lead us through this presentation is Kelly Delasky, the college's coordinator of student orientation and development. Kelly, I will turn it over to you. Great, thank you, Sally. Um, my name is Kelly Delasky, as Sally said. I'm gonna start with sharing my screen so that you guys can follow along with uh, the information that I will be sharing. And if everyone could please continue to mute themselves during Kelly's presentation and use the chat feature to ask your questions. Thank you. Absolutely. So that is a perfect segue, um, Sally. We, we meet in Career Services. Um, one of the common, uh, let me back up and say this, the Office of Career Services has four people in our office. Myself, um, as the coordinator of new student orientation and development, Amy Foster, she is the director, an assistant director of career services. Jonathan Lee works a little bit with us and a little bit with resource development and engaging alumni. And we have a new coordinator in our office, Courtney Pageant. Um, Courtney started in February pre-pandemic, uh, and then we left three weeks after she, or so after she started. Um, Courtney, I put in the bottom left, Courtney start, her main objective is to bring Handshake to our campus, which is a platform for career services and a job board. And I'll talk a little bit about that here in a bit. Let's see if I can. Whenever we do presentations, because we are on Zoom uh, for the majority of our opportunities to meet with your students on campus, I do start all of my presentations with students to let them know the expectations on Zoom for any presentation, just as Sally did. And we want to do this so that your students become familiar and comfortable with the opportunity to know what it's like to be on a Zoom session and that there is its own set of professional etiquette that is involved when you are on Zoom. So it adds a different layer, uh, but an introduction to professionalism that they need to know and be aware of. So we do start every session with that. So for you all, as Sally said, this is recorded. Please stay on mute and the chat is not locked. So if you just be aware whether you're messaging everybody or certain people privately. In career services, we are guided by a four year planning guide. It's the first year is awareness. 
the second exploration, the third is experience, and the fourth is decision making. As I said, Amy Foster works with the juniors and seniors, so I primarily work with awareness and exploration when it comes to career development, and Amy works with experience and decision making. I joke and I say that I bring students into Rona College and Amy helps them on their way out of Rona College. And uh, Jonathan helps connect them with alumni in that whole process along the way. I will give you a little bit of a background. My position started four years ago. Typically at large institutions, career services and even at other institutions, career services tends to be a place that seniors go about six or eight months before graduation, completely freaked out about what they should do with this looming sense of graduation coming when it comes to applying and getting a job. About four years ago, the college uh, had an initiative to create a position, which is my position now, to bring career exploration to freshman and sophomore students and that awareness earlier on so that we don't have this last minute panic of what they should and how they should engage with the world of um, professionalism and career development. Prior to coming to Rono College, I was a high school guidance counselor. I've sent hundreds of students to Rono College over the years and um, will then work from there to come here and now work with them as they head on with their journey in career development. Being a smaller place, um, we work with students a great deal individually. And you noticed that I'm sure in my title, Jonathan and I are going for who can have the longest title on the campus. Really my title should be coordinator of new student orientation and career development, but we decided that was entirely too long. Um, I do work with students in the onboarding process. So you may have um, seen me or heard my name through your students. I'm the person behind the orientation at roanoke.edu email. And so with that, oh, I'm glitching a little bit. I'll just talk through it. I hope it works. Um, with that, I helped to design our online summer orientation. As you all know, we wanted to bring our first year students in and have them stay overnight, which of course didn't, didn't work with COVID. And so one of the presentations that I was able to sneak in to the online summer orientation was an interest inventory. Typically in past years, I have that interest inventory. We do it in the fall semester but we took advantage of the online component and had students take it prior to coming and actually report it back to us so that I have it on record to meet with them for future conversations. So when it comes to awareness, they've already taken, anybody that participated in summer orientation has already taken an interest inventory. They've already heard a presentation about how to break down that interest inventory they, um, I tell the students when I rejoin them in the fall and we talk about their interests, I say, I'm the crazy lady that made you draw a hexagon in my presentation and summer orientation. They may not remember their interests, but they remember that I made them draw a hexagon. And then when in the fall, when I meet with classes and I meet with students, we talk again about that hexagon and what their interests meant. And I pull up their scores and we talk about their scores and how their scores and what their interests are connect to what we offer here at Roanoke. It's a way to start putting the two together, seeing what we offer and how to make it work for them. We absolutely, career development is a spectrum. And so students will come to us absolutely sure that they know what they wanna do and how to do it and how to get there. And then we have students that know zero. They have no idea, they are completely lost. Some are overwhelmed by the whole idea. And so we take it wherever they are. Everybody got the same presentation in the summer, the same interest from inventory in the summer. 
and then in the fall, I have the students meet with me individually. And at that individual conversation, I'm able to determine as this student a student who's still in the awareness category, they don't even know what we offer and what to do with it, or are they in exploration? And that's a whole separate conversation. And so when I meet with students, I try to assess pretty quickly where they are in all of that and take that from there. The interest inventory that we give is online. It's free. It takes about seven minutes and it's super accurate. It aligns with um, the similar to the strong interest inventory, but this one is through the occupational handbook. And um, it really gives us a quick snapshot of where their interests are. I tell them, your students, that in high school, they probably took an interest inventory. And I asked them if any of them ever remembers what their results were in their interest inventory. And often they were either like, they have no idea, they don't recall what that was at all or it was something so ridiculous that they remember it because they remember that they were told that they were going to be an undertaker or a bus driver or something oil rig operator that's one that used to come up super random super specific i tell the students when we do the interest inventory and we look at their results I am not looking for occupations. I am not looking for super specific jobs. They are 18, 19, 20 years old. That's developmentally inappropriate. We want them to back up and look at categories that their interests are in and use those categories to then go from there. I then will start, depending on when we meet, Right now, anybody that I've met with from now until about November, will I'll be talking to them a lot about the registration materials that we offer online uh, and show them and remind them where to find that. I talk a lot about how our INQ curriculum is really a neat way to connect them to interest areas without having to commit to certain departments as a major. Um, and then I encourage them to ask questions, to start realizing what are their interest areas and maybe go home and ask cousins, neighbors, members of your synagogue, anybody that they're, they're aware of that they think they might be interested in something cool that they do and how did they get there and what was their process like. So just to start getting an awareness of opportunities and ways that they can connect it to what we have here at Roanoke. Are there any questions about awareness in that process? Feel free to jump in the chat at any time. Won't bother me at all. Uh, okay. After, if I have a student that comes to me and knows I want to do this, we may jump past awareness into exploration. Oh, might jumped ahead of me. In the world of exploration, I shake up, good question, do the students set up these meetings or do they, um, do I find them? It's a little bit of both. I'll give you guys an inside scoop. Um, Career services isn't the most popular office on campus because we talk to your children about getting a job and like real life and real reality types of things. So we have to entice them a little bit in getting them to come here. So sometimes I tell them I will be presenting in a class. I go into handshake with them on the screen and I tell them this is how you make an appointment. And I tell them that they are required to meet with me. Is there anything I can do if they don't do that meeting? No. Do they know that? No, because they're first year students. So I get generally in that first semester, I get a 
about 80% of the freshman class solely because I tell them they're supposed to and they don't know otherwise. Now, if you're a student, I go by the INQ 110 professor and get into the class, get the students, I'll do a little presentation and then make an appointment so it's staggered throughout the whole fall term. And so if they, if your student hasn't met with me, but wants to meet with me, they can jump in line. That doesn't bother me at all. So if you have a student that says to you, like, I, no, I really have no idea what I want to do and how to connect that, they could absolutely just make an appointment with me. It's that easy. Or they can wait until I come to their class and kind of shake that tree and say, hey, you've got to make an appointment with me. Yes, they will get a notice from me. They will see me at some point. Um, the nice part with Zoom is I can keep track very easily, which I've always done in the past, but they don't have to. Um, I will tell you so far, the students this semester have been outstanding in coming to their appointments. We are scheduling them through Handshake, which sends them reminder emails if it's a Friday afternoon and they've scheduled for a one o'clock appointment and it's pouring rain, in the past I might have gotten stood up. Well, I don't have to now because they don't have to leave their room to Zoom with me. Some students do choose to meet with me individually and in person, which is fine. We um, have a space in our office downstairs that's a sun porch. We could do inside or outside. We could um, wear, we wear masks, we keep our distance, but if students do want to meet specific, uh, specifically in person, we do that. Okay, so students that jump into exploration right at the beginning. Um, this is a conversation that I lead with them typically when they're talking, of, when they have a sense of what they want and they're trying to figure out if that's what's right for them. I explain to students that they're in college for four years. They have a lot to do during the semester. The semester is a lot of work and so I really encourage them to use their summers between um, now and graduation. I explained to them that there are three summers between now and graduation. That's it. That's a little scary to some students, but in those three years, I have things that I want them to do. I always give homework. In the summer between your freshman year, sophomore year, I tell students I want them to work. I want them to hold the J-O-B. And I want them to work 30 to 40 hours a week. They all look at me like I'm crazy. Some students have done it and know how to do it and are happy to do it. And some students are like, this lady's nuts. But I, if that's the goal is to do some job, I, the job between your freshman year and sophomore year, I call it the show up on time and do what you're told. That's it. Doesn't have to connect at all with what you think you want to do. It, retail, food, whatever suits them is fine. Just something that allows them to build some of those professional skills of show up on time and do what you're told. Um, follow direction, report to somebody that's not your mom, not your coach, not a family member. Have some hard conversations about vacation and when you want to take off, and scheduling, all of those things are just as equally important as the picking your major and making a career out of it. I do also encourage five job shadowings in that summer. I don't care who it is. Find five people that do something that you think is cool. Somebody in your family, somebody that in your neighborhood, doesn't have to be super extravagant or fancy at all, that does something you think is remotely interesting. Again, similar to the appointments, if they don't come, there's not much I can do. I tell them this, if you don't do five and you do three, that's three more than they did last summer. 
So I capitalize on any bit that I can get them to do. So I, I set the bar high, hoping that if they reach it, that's perfect. And if they don't, we can still get some good work done in there. Oh, I'm going the wrong way. Summer between sophomore and junior year. Again, if they like that job from the first summer, go back. Tell them you want more responsibility. If you are a lifeguard and the next year you go back to the same place, I want them to do the schedule, do test some of the chemicals, add more responsibilities so that we they're building skills I can put on a resume, I can help them use and display. Um, if they hated the job from the first summer, okay, do something else. Then again, five more job shadowings. Maybe there's, they did three the first summer and they really wanna go back to one of those three. Or maybe they hated all three of them and now they have three to five more that they're, they've narrowed it down or thought about that branched out outside of their, what was their immediate comfort zone. Sometimes I will put in the caveat that sometimes the summer between sophomore and junior year students are ready for an internship because they have solidified what they think they want to do. Um, that would be totally appropriate. But I also explain the difference between job shadowing and internships. Job shadowing is no commitment. It is ask questions, use your manners, be professional, 30 minutes, one hour, move on, that's it, that's fine. Internship comes with a certain set of responsibility. And some students are ready to commit to that responsibility in their career area, and some students aren't. And I also want them to distinguish if they want to be a teacher and they do an internship um, in their working in their brother's office filing papers, it's not really what we're looking for. In an internship, you're looking for actually applying or being at least in the environment that you ultimately want to work. So depending on whether you're ready for that summer after sophomore year, or summer after junior year, that's fine. Summer between junior and senior year. I like to play worst case scenario. Worst case scenario, you find an unpaid internship. Ideally, we all want the 40 hour a week paid internship. If they find that, they better not tell their friends so that nobody else applies for it, so they lock it in for themselves. If they do happen to find the ideal internship, but of course, parents' worst nightmare, family's worst nightmare, it's unpaid. Well, here's the trick. If you have worked for two summers, ideally at the same place, and you go back to that employer and you say this summer, I'm a junior, I have this opportunity to do an internship, I can only pull 20 hours because I'm going to be doing 20 hours at my internship. They're going to balance that unpaid internship a little bit better because they have the opportunity to work that hostess at Applebee's that uh, lifeguard at the pool or some sort of nannying or landscaping or whatever it is, they will have that to keep some money in their pocket, continue to grow those skills professionally, and balance out that worst case scenario unpaid internship. And then of course that unpaid inter that internship opportunity is going to be that opportunity to really connect what they're doing and what they're learning in class with what is out there in the world of work. We, let me throw in a couple things in this sequence of time that our office does. In the sophomore year, we encourage students to participate in what is called the Maroon Mentor Program. The Maroon Mentor Program is a connection. I ask students, 
what's a, your ideal job, ideal career, ideal opportunity out in the world of work? We're going to find somebody that is an alumni, a parent, a friend of the college that does that. They may not be local to the campus, but now with Zoom and COVID, we've, we've all learned how to distance communicate. So that's not a big deal anymore. But I tell students that I work with the students and I prepare them for their mentorship relationship. On the other side, my colleague, Jonathan Lee and Amy Foster will work to find an alumni for them somewhere that does that, that's something that's cool. So I am a little, I like to make their job really hard. I tell students, I want you to find, tell me like your ideal, your dream mentor. One year I had a student say, okay, I want a division one, or I, he said NBA basketball coach. And I was like, uh, okay. So I go back and I tell John and Lee, I'm like, okay, we need a basketball coach, NBA coach. He was like, uh, how about division one? And the student was like, yeah, make them go high, make them work. Cause even if we get one notch down, like go for it, try and see what happens. But we have an alum who's a coach of a division one men's team. One year I had a student say she wanted a uh, FBI agent. I came back to the office and I said, good luck y'all. You gotta find an, uh, a uh, FBI agent. Well, that's especially challenging because people that work in the FBI are really easy to find because they work in the FBI. Well, we have an alum who works in the department uh, for the federal government as an agent, but she works in like finance and tax fraud and that is not at all what the student wanted. And I worked on the student side and I looked at that student and I said, this woman has been working for the FBI for 27 years. She knows people. You're going to go and you're going to talk with her and you're going to develop a relationship and she's gonna introduce you to people. She's been doing this for a long time, may not be in the area that you want, but this is what networking is about. This is the connections that you make. And that student ended up, the world, the stars aligned. The student was from Chicago. The woman was based out of the Chicago office. How that happened, I have no idea. But she actually got an opportunity to go to the office and meet with her in person, see the um, building and all the security and all everything that was involved. And in the end, she was handed an application that you only get from inside for somebody, for a student to apply to be an intern for the next summer. And so I tell all of your freshmen at the end of my conversation, whether it's about awareness or exploration, I tell them your sophomore year, when I send them an email, that the subject will be Maroon Mentor, they need to click the link, fill out three boxes and say, yes, they want to participate in the Maroon Mentor Program. Uh, we have grown in a semester from some semesters at the beginning. We had about 20, 25 sophomores each semester take advantage of it. We're well up to 100 a semester. And so I tell them, make, make Jonathan in my office work. Make him work really hard. We got to find lots of alumni for him to get connected to and get them connected back to the college so that we have um, these students can really learn from them. They may decide they don't. The ideal time in the sophomore year, they may, we had a student last year, just thought about this, who worked at a local TV station here, was connected to an alumni and it was a communications major within communications, there's a ton you can do. Thought they wanted to go into uh, production, got connected with an alumni who works in at a local station. The student decided that is not, like the film end is not what I wanna do. The alumni mentor said, okay, here are the other people in the office that are doing the writing. And she was like, yes, I love this. 
not the alumni wasn't in that room, but they can made that connection, gave them an opportunity to see other parts of what they do, which is why we'd like for them to do it in the sophomore year. We do have a number of juniors that do participate because maybe they hadn't solidified, they hadn't hit that exploration stage in the sophomore year. And so we don't say no. If a junior wants to participate, of course we're going to allow them that opportunity to participate. Um, but typically we target and market to sophomores. Questions or thoughts about the exploration end of things? I will tell you that if you do something cool, you can register to be an alumni mentor yourself. If you're not an alumni necessarily, maybe you are. Uh, but we do need the more students that ask for this, the more people in the professional world we need. And so if you have an opportunity, um, roanoke.edu backslash maroon mentor, there's a registration link. You can go in and register and you might, uh, we might have a student that says, I want to do, and it might be similar to what you do. Uh, who should we this I have a question in the chat who should the student talk to if they know their interests but don't believe there's a real job for their interest super fun I love um what I I particularly when I left I will tell you when I left K through 12 I was super excited to have a similar opportunity to go to a liberal work at a liberal arts school. If anybody makes the career development portion of the liberal arts experience difficult, it's students at a liberal arts school. There's not always this super specific direct connection. And so we work with students to find out how to make that connection, how to develop that opportunity if it's not there just like we do with um, clubs and organizations. How do you create it? How do you foster it? I met a freshman who already makes enough of an income that they have to pay taxes on buying and selling sneakers, super high end sneakers. I was like, that's like, you, you have a job doing this. I had to figure out how to add this to his resume. So tell me about what do you do? How does this work? He buys super high-end sneakers from off places that go out of business or various things and he resells them to people that want super fancy Nikes or super different kinds of shoes. And he makes enough money to do this, to like pay taxes. There are opportunities are endless for students. It's sometimes just being really creative on how to make that connection work. Send them to me. We'd love to chat with them about that. Uh, another question was, do you just communicate with students via email? We, I, as I said earlier, I go after them in their INQ 110 class. It is a fresh first year student required class. I have um, different departments that are an intro into a major, intro to psych, um, communications 101. We also, there's a whole host of majors that myself or my colleague go into the intro level major class and do some sort of, what do you do with an English major um, or whatever the department is. So we do that. Um, my staff, I said in the beginning that I also have this orientation component because we onboard the students onto campus. The staff of first year mentors all work for me. So if your student was in an orientation group, they're in an orientation group, they're in an INQ 110, their um, first year mentor works for me. I work with them quite often as they develop their relationships with students to help them, to help eyeball those kids that are not connected and don't know what they want to do or how to make it work and to send them to me. And the same as you all are welcome to send your child to me. You don't have to, at the end, I'll show you my email, but you also can just remember that I am the person behind orientation at roanoke.edu. That's me.
So whether you're emailing careers, which is another email, careers at roanoke.edu, that will give you anybody in our office, but orientation will get me as well. We are going to hire a social media um, position in our office. We all know how do you get in front of students. It's their social media. Uh, this past summer, the first year experience, create, uh, one of my students created an Instagram and we, I don't know if y'all, y'all should be following on Instagram or Facebook, first year experience. Uh, we, she developed over 350 followers in the first month. So we're hoping to do the same as we did for first year experience for career services and find a student that will get that information out to students. It could be in small uh, internship Instagram takeover days or it could be what to wear, what not to wear, things like that to different professional opportunities. Some things that are fun and silly and some things that are informational and they genuinely need to know. Okay, let, let me jump to, can I jump too far to your homework? Students know that uh, career services isn't a class. Uh, it's something that they work on all the time. I talk to them about how to organize that, how to make a folder called like my plans or my future, my advisor or something, and the things that go in it, and that they always have stuff they should be doing for their career development. It's I, the way I compare it as an independent study. I don't grade it, I don't collect it, and if they don't do it, it's just gonna be that much harder on them in the long run. So um, I will give you your homework uh, that I tell parents it is super important. Um, the relationship I will say from once your child goes off to college changes a little bit. Um, COVID is crushing one of my parts of my presentation that I usually do. Um, my mother loves to shop loves to shop. And so when she found out that I had a parents weekend session four years ago, all of a sudden in the mail, I got a suit. And I looked at the tags on my suit and she bought it at Nordstrom Rack, of course. My family's from New Jersey. She was somewhere, found this suit that was like $180 and she got it for like $35.95 or something. Still had the tags and the receipt just in case they need to take it back. It's, it's so it's funny. Every and every year my mom would send me something. Unfortunately, we all know if you're in New Jersey or the New York, Pennsylvania area, not much shopping happening right now, not much leaving the house. If they go anywhere, they go to the beach and sit at Cape May or somewhere like that. They don't have an opportunity to really go to New York or anywhere and go real shopping. So I don't have a new suit <laughs> for you all this year, but I do want to say that it doesn't end. I'm 40 years old and my mom still buys my clothes. So there's something that you can do and that I hope you take the opportunity to do to help your child grow in their career development. Uh, the first four things that are the easiest things for me to ask you to do are doing a lot of listening. When your student says to you, I think I'm gonna major in sociology, and your first reaction is, what in the holy heck do you do with a degree in sociology? Don't say that. Turn the question around and say, interesting, what do you do with a major in sociology? They might know, they might not know. And if they don't know, you can say, there's that redheaded lady who talked to you about career development she would be happy to talk to you about what you can do with sociology. And turn it back on them. This is their time to figure out how to make this work. Uh, I always say that their generation does not write thank you notes. They want to send an email. They want to send a text message. But when they get into the world of professionalism, my generation and older is who they're negotiating this with. 
So if you have the chance, if you see some thank you notes or some of those like packets of stock cards at the end of the target aisle, super on sale, grab them, stuff them in their suitcase on the way out the door, throw some stamps in there. Don't you don't have to tell them they're in there, but do that so that they have them when they need them, because we will tell them when and at what points they need them. And it's super helpful if they can be like, oh, my mom or dad already stuffed some of those in my suitcase. I have some. It doesn't hurt along the way. The third thing is to start considering your network. Your people that you know are super helpful to your students. And if your children have an interest, maybe you get your taxes done by a super small tax firm in town and your child is interested in accounting, can they give your student 30 minutes to just chat about what it's like to be in a small firm? Then if you know somebody who works in a gigantic firm, give that, ask, tell your student, this is who you reach out to your second cousin, whoever that does that works in a huge firm and they all, and they love it. Give they all they need is 30 minutes in the first year, maybe an hour in their second year. Ideally in the second year, they get to visit their office, see how that works. Um, but using your own network of people is such a huge advantage. You know more people than you even realize you do. The fourth one is my favorite, professional dress. As I said, dress is important. My mom has taught me. We wear the appropriate thing. Um, I will tell you that whether it's um, the freshman 15 or those young men who still grow two inches, I always say don't just say to your child when they come home for break, so does that suit jacket still fit you? Because their answer is going to be, of course it does. Yes, it does. And you could say, why don't you, before we do something for the holiday or before we go see somebody, why don't you put that on? Let me see it. It is super easy. Uh, my mom loves a deal. They're fabulous consignment places, but making sure that their professional clothes, they will need them and that they have them with them and that they know how to iron them. That's like a bonus. My favorite is when we go to take students, <laughs> does your mom wrench stuff out? My mom loves to shop. COVID is just not doing her any favors though. But my mom will tell you, she sent me to college with an iron because when you, oh, Sally, it's D-A-L-A, -A, not D-E. Um, my, uh, my other favorite is when they, the gentlemen come to an event and their khakis have been hanging up for so long that they've got that nice crease across the thigh because they've been on that wire hanger since Lord knows how long it's been on that wire hanger that they need to iron and press that crease out. Uh, little tricks like that, little things along the way so that they look as they present themselves confidently, that they present themselves in a way that they can be taken seriously. Uh, I talk to our HHP students all the time, just because you're held in human performance and you wear sweats in the rest of your career doesn't mean you can wear sweats to the interview. So we um, talk a lot about that. So it's super helpful if over breaks, you have those check-ins and make sure they have something to wear that they, um, that still fits. That's a big one. Any questions, throw it at me. Kelly, this was such great information. While we're waiting to see if there's any more questions, um, I apologize for mistyping your email. I was trying to be helpful. Sorry about You're that. Um, on average, how many students do the mentor process as a whole, or how many students have benefited from the Maroon Mentors program? Do you know? uh, we've been doing it, we do it three times a year. We do it fall, spring, and summer. 
um, the most, the busiest is the fall. We have upwards of 80 to 100 students in the last two fall terms that take us up on it. Um, and the men, I try to explain, I think the decline in the spring is um, usually about 50 to 70 in the spring. I think the decline is the students think that it's like a lot of work. It's really not. I, we explain to the students and to the mentors, we ask them to have three conversations. Ideally, the third is it at their place of work, but that doesn't always happen. Um, but to have a minimum three, one introductory, uh, one where we provide the students with a list, of, we give them a list of 150 questions they can pick from. Take, the, take these, pick your top five or 10 and to ask them to your alumni or your mentor. Uh, and then the third ideally is in the place that they work. That's our perfect world. So how long does a mentorship usually last? The semester or a year? It could be the semester. Sometimes students will say, I got what I needed to get and that's all I needed. Um, we talk to the students about how to maintain that relationship because they're learning. This isn't somebody you just text along the way. You don't snap them and we want them to continue this relationship. And it could be an email twice a semester, just letting them know what you're doing, where your classes have taken you, ask them some intelligent question about what they do in their professional world. Um, and then ideally they connect with them on LinkedIn. I should actually put that on homework for parents. If you don't have a LinkedIn and you still work out in the professional world, you should have a LinkedIn. Connect with your students. You have your student help you make a LinkedIn after that they don't know how to do it yet, but we'll teach them how to do it and they can teach you how to do it. Uh, but how to use LinkedIn to maintain that relationship through messaging or emailing or things like that. It can have, we have had students that are meeting with their mentors alumni weekends when their mentors are coming to campus when we are in person. Something you said um, during your presentation about um, a job, a summer job or an internship that maybe doesn't, isn't one you want to go back to. And I was thinking about the value of even that experience oh, yeah. or even a mentorship with an alumni mentor that shows you or clarifies, perhaps this isn't what I thought it was going to be, isn't what I want to do. And, and do you talk to the students about that's as valuable oh, as yes. finding, that, finding that great internship? Yes, I actually start talking to students about that in the awareness category. Um, and I can stop sharing my screen. Um, in the awareness category, for at the very beginning with students, sometimes when a student is super overwhelmed by all of the options that we offer, I do say, well, let's talk about the things we know you don't want to do. Based on your interests, you will never major in math whatever it is. And then often they look at me and they say, yes, I will never major in math. I'm like, okay, that's an entire building on campus that you'll take the one required class because we make you take a math class and then you're done. Never take another class in there again. And that's okay. It's just as helpful to know what you don't want to do. And that is a, absolutely a value right there. I start off often with students and telling them I was going to be a nurse. Clearly that didn't happen. So eliminating things is just as important. And that alumni mentor, we, we actually, Jonathan on his end of things, coaches the mentors in, you know, this may not be what your student wants to do and that's okay. That, and you're just being helpful in their process. Well, Kelly, while we were discussing, I haven't seen any other questions that that came through. So I think we will wrap up our time. Um, want to thank all the parents, family representatives who were on our call today and um, spending a little time with us this afternoon. Again, we missed seeing you all on campus and um, we are enjoying all the students that are here and hearing from those that have decided to stay home and do school virtually. 
Um, Kelly is here, the whole career services team is here as a resource to your students and um, to you all. And please feel free to reach out and definitely encourage your student to reach out to the team. And on behalf of the Office of Alumni and Family Relations, I want to say again, thank you to Kelly Delasky and thank you to all our participants and we hope to see you soon. Stay well and stay safe. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Thank you.